There's going to be a senior shakeup in the police department after yesterday's chaotic events at the Port of Belize. As the police minister made very clear last night, there will be, quote, hell to pay for whoever gave that directive to invoke the riot act during a protest inside the Port of Belize compound. The man under the most pressure is the officer commanding Eastern Division, Assistant Commissioner of Police Alden Dawson. He was the officer in charge on the ground and the man who got the directive saying that the workers should be left to protest peaceably on the compound. Here's how explicitly the police minister put it yesterday. My instructions to the commissioner was clear. I am sure that his instructions to his commander was also clear because there was a three-way phone call where I had myself, the commissioner, and the commander for that, for that division. And the instructions were clear that those persons were to remain there until, at the very least, the court had ruled. Somebody, some police officer or police officers, decided upon themselves, obviously, to ignore those instructions. And so if the minister was clear and the commissioner was clear, how did the message get so confused when it went down the chain of command? Best information says the mix-up occurred somewhere between ACP Dawson and the GSU personnel on the ground, including the officer who read the riot proclamation. We are also told that the officer commanding the GSU has taken some level of responsibility for the actions of his men. Best information suggests, though, that ACP Dawson, being the most senior officer, may take the brunt of it. Reliable reports say he could be placed on administrative leave while an investigation is ongoing. For the interim, at least, the newly named assistant commissioner, Dr. Richard Rosado, would reportedly take the helm as officer commanding Eastern Division. There's no word yet on what will happen to the GSU, but some transfers are expected. Today, the commissioner of police would only say that nothing has been decided as yet, and the decision will be announced tomorrow. So what really happened on the ground yesterday that is forcing the senior shakeup in the police department? We know that the GSU went into full riot squad mode when it was not directed to do so. But tonight, Cherie Salsal, who was on the front line all morning, re-examines the events of yesterday to find out exactly where things took a turn from civil unrest a paramilitary attack. That's what the question should be. Who gave the order to make people with stand up for their rights face the end level of brutality? Who gave the order for them to go home? Oh, right. Who gave the order? Martin was shot down. Oh, right. Who gave the order? That's the question that's been booming across Belize since last night. But whoever's responsible is set to suffer the vengeance of the state. They will be held to pay because under no world, under no sky, and in no world would I send the police department to rough up and arrest Stevie Doors on behalf of the vampire Michael Ashcroft and his Belizean minions. That would never happen in a million years. But it happened. But it happened, and so somebody will feel the wrath of the government. But where did things turn? How did an executive order say one thing, yet the complete opposite happens on the ground? While the Compo and the AG try and figure that out, our team on the ground knows that this moment, where a fire truck was blocked from putting out a burning car, is where things started to take a turn. Smoke billowed out from inside the compound as the stevedores marched in in droves, chanting, touch one, touch all, 
and in the chaos, someone hurled a bottle and smashed this window. Enter the riot squad, who took their formation between the crowd and the port. All the while being provoked by Raymond Dingit Rivers, a man who by no coincidence, at the end of the day, would sustain a scatter of wounds from the GSU's rubber bullets. But while Dingit could be seen to play the aggressor, CWU President Mose Hyde, seen here in animated conversation with the Commissioner of Police, did his best to calm the situation, giving the crowd the instruction to sit. But that didn't last, and a few minutes later, protesters both inside and outside the fences were throwing their hands up in a show of peaceful solidarity against the police. Coming back to that struggle for the door, and what was really at stake there, because as the door was held open, and with the fence compromise, protesters were breaching not just the port, but undermining its international security regulations, threat to the integral security of the port. We don't know if that's what the GSU was responding to, but after reading the riot act and releasing the first canister of tear gas, the GSU sought to restore order on their paramilitary terms. The protesters dashed off in a wild frenzy, but as they ran, some of them stopped to hurl more bottles and rocks at the GSU. We believe, we firmly believe, it can be shown to other media houses that the GSU was not provoked. The GSU actually provoked and instigated what has uh, manifested itself here this afternoon. What, so, was, what was your reaction when you saw your brother on the ground? When we saw him, we thought I, I felt the same way, but where I was, I was just, I was just in shock and awe to re realize that the people we depend on, the law, the justice that should pro protect us, has uh, actually took, be, took to be criminal. And, and it's really painful to see and to hear the words that, that the other workers keep uttering out that on a chance to be abusive. We haven't done any crime to you and now you have victimized us in such a way that we believe that it's truly uncalled for. Once they had cleared the area, the GSU commander on the ground was satisfied that their mission, clearing the compound, had been accomplished and that they would not pursue. For the commissioner, they had accomplished the opposite of what he wanted them to do. When I received that call, I called the OC in Eastern Division and I directed that the GSU be removed immediately. Mr. Dawson assured me that he was going on the grounds to ensure that the GSU were removed. But by that time, the damage was already done because persons were already shot with rubber bullet and people had become more agitated. Whoever read that riot act was reading it not on behalf of the state, but on behalf of themselves. And in the aftermath, we caught up with Labour Senator Elena Smith, who had come out in a show of solidarity with the CWU and was shocked at the way the day had turned out. I don't understand why is it that we ended up at this point. And these officers were behaving as if they were, they were being attacked. And they, some of them were the ones who were throwing things around. But they were throwing things, but then they attacked the people who were here. And, and in their view, they was like, just attacking anybody who was in, in the way, they just attacked. They didn't care who it was, whether you were doing or not. We have every right to fight for what we deserve. And there is no reason why they should have behaved the way they behave today. No, absolutely none at all. Today, the port is not operational, with its security level raised from a one to a three. It's a consequence of protesters breaching restricted areas and, according to the port, has caused, quote, serious consequences to the flow of goods into stores and to cargo exporters attempting to get their goods to the international market for the foreseeable future. So while the pandemonium on the ground played out on a cinematic scale, there are very real social, economic and political consequences for all parties involved. While the moving hand behind it all the Ashcroft Alliance remains distant, insulated, and perhaps bemused. Sharice Halto, 7 News. But bemused is not the tone we would use to describe the tone of a Port of Belize Limited press release that came out today. That comes off as accusatory, says, quote, PBL and the greater Belizean economy were sabotaged by violent CWU members who put innocent lives at risk by setting fire to vehicles, setting fire to equipment, 
destroying infrastructure and throwing projectiles at the police. And owing to yesterday's events, the port was shut down today. Operations at a complete standstill, all the heavy equipment parked, no containers moving. As we told you at the end of the news, the Belize Port Authority downgraded the port of Belize security level from one to three, which forces a closure. The notice says, quote, the port of Belize Limited is temporarily closed for operation until further notice. The cargo vessel that came into port yesterday, the Pakol, the Pakora, that is, remains anchored off the Belize City coast tonight, standing by and waiting in the hopes that the Port of Belize will be reopened soon. But today it remained at security level 3 with no movement inside, no revenue and no labor. We are told there are plans to work the sugar vessel tomorrow, but that is pending discussions with the Port Authority. So the only activity at the port is the sit-in being staged by stevedores and port employees in the shed and on the roadside next to the port. And that's where we found Minister of Transport Edmund Castro today. He wasn't there stumping for votes or elaborating on police. He was giving out sal beef tacos, which is a whole other story. But we did have some very serious questions for him as Minister with Responsibility for Ports. Here's that exchange. The Port Authority last night sent out a notice to this port saying that its uh, security classification had been moved from one to three. That renders the port inoper inoperative. What is the status with that right now? The, I know there have been talks between the Port Authority and the Port of it's, 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 uh, it's a talk that is continuing, and I think that... Um, by hopefully by the end of today or sometime we will have some kind of clarity but in the event that this port cannot function we are also in negotiation and, and talking with uh, Big Creek Port to take some of the, the, the cargo ships that will be coming into Belize. We cannot stop um, ships coming into Belize, goods and services coming into Belize. We can't stop that. So we must have an alternative to this situation. This security tree classification how long will this stand i am hoping that, that calm heads will prevail and that we will we will be able to resolve this situation uh, rather quickly now the port of belize is blaming the stevedores they sent out a press release saying that it's the stevedores fault breaching the thing and this has implications for international trade etc how could they be so brutal how could they ask a brother or a sister firing that person by via text and ask them to be happy? I think that is the most ludicrous, foolishest I have seen or heard in a long time. The owners and operators of the of, of Port of, of Belize, man, they should have known better. Don't see your handle people, but if they the workers out here feel aggrieved and they are doing a sitting like they are doing now and protesting peacefully. I don't see no problem with that. The message should be sent to the owners of the Port of Belize that man you can't treat for we people here like no damn puppy. And while the port remains immobilized by that downgrade in its security rating, it will have to mobilize to go back to the Supreme Court tomorrow. At 10 a.m., Justice Sonia Young is expected to deliver a ruling on whether or not she will grant an injunction against the Port of Belize. As we told you yesterday, the Attorney General's Ministry applied to the Supreme Court for this relief on behalf of the Labor Department. The government is attempting to ensure that the purported layoffs of those 36 port employees can presumably be reversed. The Labor Department stresses that in cases of proposed layoffs for redundancy, the employer has an obligation to give one month's notice to the Labor Commissioner and the union. They are insisting that the port did not do this, and so from their perspective, the layoffs are null and should be reversed. The port says that it fully complied with the labor laws. Today we got perspective on that from the presidents of the Christian Workers Union and the National Trade Union Congress of Belize who showed up at the port for lunchtime solidarity. They said they support the ministry. 
honestly our hope is that it's not that late that there is uh, is still room for um, some progress in that front. We believe that given the the uh, position and the actions taken by the Labour Department in this regard now is a plus for the movement, it's a plus for the brothers here at PBL and we believe that it can have significant uh, impact. There are so many outstanding matters to deal with that represents a government effort that I can't knock. It's, we would hope that it's successful. We joined as an interested party. You all have been critical of the, um, the, the, the process or at least the efforts from the Labour Department and the Labour Ministry. What are your thoughts, given that they've they, they, they at least went to the court to try to come to the, the workers' aid. Well, we are we are thankful, no, that they took that extra step because, honestly, um, there there were some mistakes made along the way. Um, mainly, um, I think that the letter that they sent to the the Port of Belize Limited did not really encompass the enormity of the of and the gravity of the situation. Um, mainly, they specified the issue of the 10%. And I think that um, probably there was some oversight because that letter should have encompassed all the different issues that are affecting the workers and that are bringing the industrial relations to this sort of uh, uneasy climate between the two um, parties involved. The union leader were there because the NTUCB made a call today to all subsidiary union affiliates to show support for Christian Workers Union. The unions are converging on the CWU's behalf under the principle that if you touch one union member, you touch all. The NTUCB president said it's more than symbolic. The decision to choose the port came at the heels of what happened yesterday. No? I think it was... Um, most unfortunate that we witness those events um, of our brothers and our sisters being hurried in the way they were and treated in a very inhumane manner by uh, members of the authorities. No? Um, that prompted us to uh, redirect our efforts here at Port because we believe that these brothers and sisters here need the support and they need to understand that they are not alone in this war. As a union, we believe in solidarity. And so solidarity simply means that you are, you are showing support, you are you know, there with the people who are hurting because when your turn comes, you expect to have solidarity as well. So from our end as BNTU, we are fully supporting um, the persons here at the port. Part of this struggle is to deal with the real life impact of this crisis on men and women who are part of the staff, especially those who have been identified as the ones to be declared redundant. To see this kind of outpouring of support, I could see it on their face very mean to them. And because I could see that to give them a lift, right, then that gave them a sense of uh, 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 energy. You feel me? Like, like really the, the big thing, and we have to say to to all of the union members, uh, we support today and come out and show them a face of solidarity. In the immediate aftermath of what transpired yesterday, rather than cowering away, rather than retreating to just writing a comment on Facebook, these folks came down to the front line and have stood with them. And that is, that is such a boost and such a lift. As long as we don't feel that our brothers, every single one of the 36 that were terminated and the others, inclusive of all the other issues that they were fighting for, is being addressed properly by this company, we will keep on the pressure and we will not keep on the pressure like this. We will continue to escalate this. Other union members in Bemopan went to the labor office in the capital city to protest and declare their support for the 36 workers. The NTUCB is also demonstrating support for the University of Belize's faculty and staff union. As viewers are aware, the newly certified union is attempting to look after the well-being of its members at the university, which is facing massive budget cuts. President Marvin Mora told us that he hopes that the university's administration is being fair and honest in addressing the union's concerns 
about the shared financial sacrifices that have to be made for the next school year. Our position with our brothers um, at the university is uh, similar to the position that we have here with the brothers here, that we believe that in good faith and uh, in order for things to progress, all those people in authorities need to come clean and need to present to the unions and their leaders all the information that they are requesting. That seems to be the sticking point. If you have nothing to hide, then why worry? Present the information so that the process can move forward. If the university uh, management believes that they have everything as per the books, well then open up the books. I don't think that there is any information in there that will be so extra sensitive. We're not talking about a nuclear power plant or a scientific research as such, brother. We're talking about a university that belongs to the people of Belize. We also asked the president of the Christian Workers Union about the perspective of PBL management. In a press release, the Port of Belize said, quote, for hours the CWU members caused these unfortunate incidents on the port that included serious and dangerous vandalism to property, including vehicle fires, tampering with the electrical supply, smashing windows and destroying IT infrastructure. PBL wishes to thank the authorities for their efforts to regain control after bearing witness to these acts, end quote. Seven News has also seen a recent correspondence between the CWU president and a representative of the port's management. That representative makes it clear that the port will not disclose any financial information. The CWU has been demanding to see the port's finances so that they can determine whether the proposed pay cuts are justified. In a letter dated July 20th, Pablo Salinas, the chief operating officer of the port, wrote to CWU President Singh, the union is asking for, quote, financial and highly confidential information, including audit financial statements, existing PBL contracts, cash flow projections, dividends to shareholders, management fees, debt service information, and the entire financial guts of PBL, a private company. It is obvious and unfortunate that we hold widely divergent interpretations of the redundancy provisions of the Labor Act, end quote. In our interview this afternoon, we put a few of those divergent views from the port to the CWU president. Here's that conversation, starting with the port's insistence that they have no obligation to release sensitive financial information. Not only have we made that request to other entities, but that request has been complied with even without having such specific, specific accommodation in the respective agreements. Those companies understood we are in the pandemic and we are essentially stabilizing our entity using the worker. So ethically, morally, when you are saying to somebody, I need you for help me, I need you for sacrifice for the company, that person have every right to say to you, okay boss, I can see how the things stand for real so I could know how much I want need to give up. Because I can't be in at the dark when it comes to when need to give up, when I need to give it up. You want people in the dark with no access to the actual data. Take one leap of faith and believe you and then look back on your track record since you come from you call you the box way from you call you the punch way from you call you know the respect the agreement from you call you know what deal with transparency this is not the time we power we could grow any faith in a you the suggestion that we are somehow outside of our jurisdiction thank you to request documents so that we can make informed interventions they are taking the negative view the opposite view that yesterday's protest was nothing peaceful they're suggesting that your membership acted violently and destroyed their infrastructure burn um, vehicles on the compounds they're suggesting that you all handle this particular situation in a unruly and unprofessional manner Show me where the fence came down. Show me where the, there was any forced entry into the compound. Show me. Show me the video footage which indicates that there was a riot going on. 
Like I know I respond to for any simple comments. Right. I want you with the facts. Yeah. Was there a riot going on on the part of our workers? Look at the images. Was there a riot? Because the response was to a riot. Was there a riot? There was none. So for them to feel comfortable in suggesting that there was an appropriate response by the enforcement arm of the state, when the prime minister of the country, the attorney general of the country, and the commissioner of police is saying that the response was not appropriate, but they believe it was, that speaks to their character again. We'll take a break now. Later on, we'll have a slight return to the port to find out what Edmund Castro was doing with those sal beef tacos. Plus, the YMCA bridges the digital divide while social distancing do. You'll see how. Don't go away. Smart Loyalty Rewards Program. You have tons of rewards waiting to be claimed just for using prepaid services. Now, let's get those rewards. But first, we need to download the Smart Police app from Google Play or the Apple's App Store. Open the app and click Register. Then, click Get Activation Code. You'll receive an SMS. Now, enter your number and the code to activate the Smart app. Open the app and rewards are now accessible. In my account homepage, you see how many stars you have and how many you've redeemed. To see a list of rewards available, just click the Go to Rewards button and let's start redeeming. With my rewards, I'll redeem 140 stars for 1,000 megabytes of data for more TikTok uploads and 60 stars for 75 SMS. It's that easy! You can also get extra on-uploads with your stars by just clicking Activate and the next time you put in credit, you'll get your reward. So remember, just for making calls, texting and using data, you get free reward points that you can redeem using the app, all from your fingertips. Smart, your full-service telecom provider. Looking for a paint which offers durability, fast drying action, easy application, long lasting protection, and low order? Then Coronado is the brand you need. Choose from eggshell, flat, or semi gloss finishes for your home's interior or exterior. You can also protect your deck from the harsh outdoor elements with Coronado Maxum deck and siding stain. We also have primers, masonry, and metal coatings for other projects around your home. Benny's Paint Center has the paint you need in the color and finish you want. Enjoy your newly painted home with long-lasting, durable Coronado paints. Available at Benny's. Quality and savings. Ready and pump for So you need a mobile plan that can keep up. Digi is now offering unlimited talk and text. And double the data on all plans and up to 60 gigs for the plus plan. All backed up by the fastest and largest mobile network. More work, more fun, more you. Visit your nearest Digi store today. Nothing at all? But yeah, bro, just put on the sauce. I could tell you we're done. This is Billy Kid. Time for a new one. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Stay strong, Billy. <laughs> Billy Kid, the beer of Billy's. Trimming the hedges and overgrown trees. Packing food supplies. 
ensuring that you have medical supplies and important documents are all part of your hurricane preparations. But what about your home insurance? An insurance policy with RFNG Insurance gives you the confidence that your home and possessions are protected when a natural disaster strikes. Include RFNG in your hurricane plans and join the thousands of Belizeans who have learned why it pays to get it right. RFNG Insurance is a voting company. NextGen's Back to School Raffle for a chance to win one of four fantastic back to school prizes. First place winner will receive a brand new laptop. Second prize is a brand new printer. Third prize is one month free NextGen bundled service. And fourth prize is a NextGen backpack filled with school supplies. Do you qualify to enter? New and existing customers who sign up for any NextGen service or customers who make payment in the month of July will receive a chance to win. Our raffle will be drawn on July 31st, 2020. For more information on our services, feel free to contact our representatives. Visit a branch office near you or conveniently make payments online for a chance to win. NextGen, powered by Central TV and Internet. Thirty-one-year-old Raymond Jenkins was shot and killed yesterday while waiting for a cell phone to be repaired in Calcutta Village in the Curzal District. It happened at about 2.15 when Jenkins and a minor were parked outside the home of Alric Chi. That's when two masked men wearing dark clothing and riding a motorcycle pulled up beside them. And the passenger opened fire on Jenkins. The men then sped off, leaving Jenkins, who had covered the minor with his body bleeding profusely and crying out for help. He was driven to the Curzal Community Hospital by Chi, where he eventually succumbed to his injuries. Police suspect it may be drug-related. On Monday's newscast, we took you to Ladyville in a neighborhood near to the Mirage Road that's become a sort of crime hotspot. That's where 22-year-old Egbert Baldwin was gunned down and mercilessly killed. Up until last week Thursday, Eggy, as he was also known, was on remand for four years while he awaited trial for a May 2016 shootout, which happened at the Lozano family home. While a group of young men was socializing in the family yard located on Mirage Road, a group of gunmen ambushed them and a shootout occurred between rivals of two warring gang groups from that neighborhood. After the gunshots ended, three men left injured and one man was shot and killed. Baldwin was charged with attempted murder for that shootout, but last week he was acquitted in a trial without a jury. Two days later, he was murdered and tonight the cops think that a member of the Lozano family was involved in his killing. He's 19-year-old Cameron Lozano, a resident of number 2B Mirage Road. Lozano and 19-year-old Albert Gill, another Ladyville resident, have been jointly charged with Baldwin's murder. They will be arraigned and remanded to prison at the earliest convenience. It is believed to be an act of revenge for a previous killing. And from cold-blooded murder to attempted arson, it's a criminal act that was almost perpetrated on Belize Bank's Albert Street branch. At around 2.46 this morning, security footage shows a pickup truck reassembling a Ford 150 cab parking beside the building and dropping off five tires. And by about three, a police patrol noticed the tires kindled by grass burning beside the bank. 
Their quick actions may have saved the building and resulted in no damage being done. But while the vehicle is visible in the surveillance footage, police couldn't make out the license plate due to poor visibility. Obviously, the connection can be drawn that this arson attempt on the Ashcroft Alliance's flagship, Belize Bank, may be related to the unrest at the Port of Belize. And two buses played a big part in that unrest yesterday. One of the buses was parked in front of the port's main entrance at 6.30 a.m. and the other was set on fire down by the customs building at around 8.30 a.m. Well, the buses are for Yanni Rosado and this very unlucky vehicle owner says they were stolen from his washman. Actually, I give my buses to a young man to be detailed. And when I watch the TV this morning, my boss the out here. Oh, I catch fire, you know, and I was waiting for the police to come and ask me any questions or find out how the boss get here. But I get out of it. I came earlier this morning, the media wasn't here, so I come back here again to let the people know that I feel bad to see my boss broke up and burn up. But I feel more bad to see my people be punished. So I won, Mr. Ashcroft. I have a great loss today, but I deal with them people here, and I will take loss of my bosses. If you look on the engine, brand new, then just fix it up. It doesn't think fix it inside to see my boss out there. But it hurt me more to see the people out there punishing. Very notably, Rosado's D-Max pickup was stolen from in front of his house in December of 2019. And we'll take a break now, but when we come back, we'll take you to the Y for a computer learning program that's connecting generations through digital learning. Don't go away. time to sign up for the best postpaid plans in the country because Digi has doubled the data in all their plans. Now you can get even more done, connect even more, stream even more, create even more and share even more. All on the fastest mobile network that gives you the most coverage nationwide. Now is the time to go postpaid with plans starting as low as $49 monthly. Shared plans are also available, all with unlimited talk and text. So don't wait. Hurry over to your nearest Digi store to sign up today. Enjoy double the data in all postpaid plans only with Digi. Want to know our secret? Learning can be even more fun away from the classroom. Learning art, gardening skills, PE that's actually fun, and even about our amazing animals. Learning from home is enjoyable, especially since we're in it together. The UDP said they would support the workers. They said they would help the workers. Then hours after, they sent the police with rubber bullets and tear gas. That is cold and inhumane, Mr. UDP. Even for you, with a history of abusing the people. These are people with families to support. They need their jobs. They have rights. But you don't care, do you, Mr. UDP? The people won't forgive or forget. Don't grieve, just leave. It is time for all of you to go.
The Young Men's Christian Association is bridging the digital divide for students and teachers in the Port Laula area. It's a summer camp that they've dubbed the Technology Education Summer Program aimed at flattening the education and technology curve for marginalized students. Sharice Salsal popped into their open day and got to see firsthand how teachers and students are helping each other to embrace the information age through methods that may well become the standard in the new norm for education. Here's that story. The YMCA is coming to the end of a very unique and futuristic three-week summer camp. They've focused on bridging the technological divide between students and teachers in their neighborhood. And yesterday, at their open day, we spoke to the WISE executive director, Clara Cuellar, who says that the freedom to connect is critical to every child's success. The biggest gap that will happen in the education technology during this COVID time is students, even if they have a device, it's one device and five children in there, and then the quiet and the assistants at home. So it is critical that a center like this where we are visioning provides devices and the internet speed with the bandwidth they need. And so the excitement is to know that here we have what we call old school, new school, caring and loving together as a team. The youth school has done all the learning of the Moodle device and devised court and they sat down with teachers and learned a lot of educational pedagogy and then turned around and created what was useful for the teachers. Neri Santino is one of the young people spearheading this project. Neri is a sixth form student and alumni of the Y who suggested the use of the university platform Moodle as a means of giving instruction while physically distancing too. This summer specifically we're doing um, summer school a little bit differently because um, we want to enforce social distancing but at the same time that doesn't have to limit the um, students ability to learn and so we came up with these uh, online classes uh, you're still in a classroom but you're doing it online so teacher and students can keep that distance away from each other and we use this learning management system called Moodle where we uploaded all our various assessments or lesson plan that the teacher is going to teach for the day and their worksheets, tests, quizzes, everything are uploaded onto Moodle. We hope that this will be the way that they will do it when they go back to school and here they're getting their practice so that they would know just basic things about technology, how to turn on a computer, how to log on, how to um, just move around on a mouse and keyboard and things like that. Clifton Baldwin is another of the WISE youth leaders and he's taken on a technical role as a wireman, ensuring that these classrooms don't have to put up with any buffering. I run internet cord in the ceiling and attics to some of the, the stops so they can get access to the internet through cords and it's very fast. It's actually fun because when I was much younger than this, we didn't even know about internet, but now that I'm helping um, other children and they're using Kindles and stuff, it makes me happy to know that they're, they're getting what I didn't get. Clifton has been coming to the Y since he was very little and eventually became a youth leader. Last year, he topped his class, but when the pandemic struck and the Y had to close its doors, Clifton was struggling to find an internet connection that would allow him to keep up with all the virtual homework he'd been assigned. Cuellar realized she couldn't allow him to be left behind and gave him the internet access he needed, even while the facility was closed. Although it was closed, I still had the access to came and did my online classes here. And I have a whole room for myself that I could just do my work. And it was very good for me. But what's remarkable about this program is not only the technical skills that the children are gaining, but the leaps of knowledge that the volunteer teachers have had to make to be able to deliver instruction on a web-based platform. Until this COVID-19 came along and we had to make a change. And I think the change is for the better and also for the safety of ourselves and the children. Did you ever think that you would be operating like this? I, I, I had never thought that I would have been doing it like this. I've never ever thought that sometime in my lifetime as a teacher I would have been teaching using the computer or, or, or another device. Niri Santino has been their guiding hand. She says she was happy and surprised at their level of motivation and their willingness to learn.
When it is very relieving and it is, I feel very happy because um, it was something that I was pushing for and I have very high hope in our teachers, even though they're old, they're very motivated and willing to learn. And I, I took my time, I developed a lot of patience and I took my time to teach them all the things that they need to learn. And they were very open to learning it. So for me to see them now using it and not having to, oh, Nira, I need your help here. It's very relieving and I'm very happy that they were able to do it. Sharice Halto, 7 News. The program, which has benefited from many generous donors, is still in need of assistance with a lot of the equipment vital to the program being borrowed on a short-term basis, rigged together or donated by small donors. If you'd like to make a donation to the YMCA, you can contact Clara Cuellar and her staff at 672-5535 or by emailing them at ccuellar at ymcabelize.org. Two weeks ago at the UDP convention, we showed you UDP Minister Edmund Castro's Sal Beef pop-up shop right outside the convention. Well, today he took his tailgate tacos to the port of Belize for some Sal Beef solidarity. We asked him about it. Based on the situation at hand and how our Belizean people have been brutally fired, attempt to fire, I decide that today I will, after a couple of calls from some of the, the frontline workers here at the port, for me to come in and, and at least show solidarity. So I came out this afternoon, I brought some Papa Jeff's smoked salt beef tacos and I shared with the solidarity workers here at the port. I think it's, 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 it's terrible, it's rough, especially in COVID time, for a profitable uh, a private business such as this to be trying to delete and fire so many poor Belizeans. You can do promotion of your product on top of this, at this painful time for their people. Very good one, my brother. But at this time, if you notice the icebox there in my vehicle, I am not selling no Papa Jeff's smoked salt beef. I am providing smoked salt beef tacos to them, which I did. I never offer to sell, not even one out here today. But I think my presence as a minister of government to show the, 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 the human side of things. Now, the other interpretation can be that, man, how can you have the gall to come out after your, your government police force unleashed <laughs> such cruelty on these same persons yesterday? But if you notice, not one of them out here, our, our poor Belizeans are hostile to me. Not one hostile to me. Because they know exactly that the instruction was, was and has never been to brutalize our people out here. Beef, if you like my photo, barbecue, free tacos. Are you free tacos, you free water. Solidarity. We thank our friend Joe Lopez for those pictures and a video. And while Castro was slinging sal beef to lighten the mood at the port, there was already a sour taste in the mouths of port workers from that salty port press release we've been telling you about all night. That press release from the port called the protest vandalism and another in a series of illegal strike actions. Tonight, the CWU says that they are distorting facts and reality and they ought to retract their press release. Less than a half hour ago, the union sent out its own release saying, quote, CWU unreservedly rejects PBL's baseless and scurrilous pretentious pretensions, that is, at victimization by CWU. In truth, it is CWU and our members who have been victims of PBL's long-running and unconscionable abuse. At this juncture, PBL should redeem itself and do the honorable thing by withdrawing its press release and apologizing." End quote. Apart from responding to the port, the union says that it is getting ready to take legal action against the management. The president explained why this afternoon during their daily lunchtime protests at the port's entrance. 
We have our own cases that we are in the middle of building. Some very important cases. And that work is being done as we speak. Because in this process, you have to understand that the, the result of a court case is, is important. We don't know how it's going to go. But either way, what we have said to our members, that our fight for justice for them, starting with the 36 members who were allegedly terminated by text message, is one that we are going to challenge the validity of it to the end. Because there is going to be a court in our judiciary based on the available evidence that we have that what took place there was a violation of the highest degree, union busting and an unlawful termination of 36 hardworking people. So that is the kind of preparation and the type of journey that we are collective gearing up for. On the matter of the 10%, since they have refused to be a part of the Labour Tribunal, again, we are committed, and not only committed, but we are also convinced there is going to be a court that says you cannot take away a worker earning. There is a basic protection of wage without you getting that consent from that worker. So we stand on that as well. We definitely stand on the fact that our collective bargaining agreement specifically in black and white, gives us the authority to request financial documents from PBL. It's in black and white to preserve good industrial relation. The union, the PBL, must provide, shall, how you like me, Audrey? Shall, shall provide all financial documents as far as a reasonable request to maintain good industrial relations. We cannot leave unaccounted the fact that there seems to be ambiguity about the use of the paramilitary, which we now know exists because it was said so by the commissioner. We cannot leave unaccounted the ambiguity that exists about who gave that order. And so we have to pursue that legally for all our members who endured the, 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 the effect of that response, especially those who were injured. In tomorrow's news, we'll have the outcome of the injunction application which the Attorney General's Ministry has brought against the Port of Belize. And finally, tonight we have a condemnation of the actions of the GSU at the Port by the National Evangelical Association of Belize. That group says it is appalled at the, quote, misuse of authority that resulted in the escalation of the conflict. They call the actions of the GSU, quote, horrendous and completely unacceptable. And that's all we have for you for tonight. Thanks for joining us with your news. I'm Indira Craig. Remember that you can see a streaming video of this newscast at 7newsbelize.com brought to you by Digi4. The best postpaid plans in the country. Remember to wear a mask at all times in public and to keep your social distance because it is the law. Cherise Halsau will be back here tomorrow at 6. And until we meet again, have a great day.